I, I found the police department and the public works here at Belmar to be first class, first rate in all of our communications and helped us pull up a, a first class event here in the second year. experience when they came here, a great family experience when they came here. We wanted people making sure that they, they took a broom to their area, kept it clean, kept it nice, uh, and I can tell you Molly did a great job supervising all those people. Uh, and it's not easy, because sometimes it, it's difficult for people to change their behaviors they've been doing for year after year, uh, but we thought it was important to start uh, in that direction and have a real first class operation. Um, Molly thoroughly performs every task needed, no matter how large or small. And Molly is absolutely indispensable to Beach Director Kevin O'Donnell and DPW Supervisor Mike Campbell, who nominated her for this award. And it's nothing like having two bosses have to answer. <laughs> so, uh, and make it easy. Uh, make it easy. So Molly gets $100, uh, courtesy uh, of the Belmar Business Partnership to spend on Belmar businesses of her choosing. Fantastic. Uh, and also Molly uh, is a teacher. I am, up in Middletown. Yeah. So, uh, and, and Molly's sister, uh, Natalie, recently got married. I would just like to thank everyone for going to Belmar and enjoying our lovely beach, and to Kevin and Mike who make my job rather easy. All you have to do is show up and smile. So thank you all, and thank you guys. Basically, just so that you all get a little background on it, uh, the South Monmouth Regional Sewer Authority is comprised of eight communities, each one having a representative. And we all have an equal portion of that. And right here tonight, we're basically here to discuss the Lake Como situation where the flooding and so forth, trying to come up with solutions and and really whose part that we all take part in is basically Belmar, Lake Como, and uh, Spring Lake involved with this. And uh, Mike Ruppel, our executive director uh, over at the South Monmouth Regional Sewer Authority, is, uh, I don't know, expert doesn't seem to be a, a nice enough word. He's, he's great in this area, he's well versed in it. Um, 
we hope to be the lead agency when we do come up with a solution in this. Um, and with further ado, Mike. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Mayor and Council that uh, most of the people here tonight are here to hear our presentation. <clears throat> but I know that you've got a packed agenda, so we're going to try to uh, condense this presentation a little bit. Um, if I could, uh, Ryan, does Ryan have the control of the yeah. slides? You just want to tell me why? Uh, Ryan, why don't you do it? So if I do a Colleen, I'll be, uh, uh, we'll have Ryan's vacation up there. <laughs> um, so we're really here to have an exchange of information uh, as to as to uh, what the South Thomas role might be in remediating the problems at the lake, <clears throat> as well as uh, solidifying the partnership between the communities that uh, Mr. Corey had mentioned uh, and the authority. <clears throat> Uh, talk about some continued planning efforts and uh, moreover I think to eliminate uh, rumor and conjecture about why Lake Como uh, floods, how it floods, and what can and can't be done out there. So it's more of a fact-finding mission than a presentation of, of just solutions or answers. So with that, if we can go into the presentation, Ryan. <clears throat> Lake Como, uh, as you're all aware, is an impoundment that lies between uh, Communities of Belmar, Lake Como, and Spring Lake. There's a 30 acre lake. Uh, key and critical to the impoundment is, is a outfall structure that's in the south uh, east quadrant and then discharges through a 24 inch, uh, actually a 30 inch pipeline that can reduce down to 24 inches. Uh, that pipeline uh, has been in existence as far as we know since the lake's been in existence. Uh, key and critical for this slide are two SMRSA facilities that are owned, uh, owned and operated by SMRSA. We have the Lake Como pumping station right here, and what we refer to as our Pitney Avenue pumping station right here. It collects and conveys wastewater from both Spring Lake and uh, the community of Lake Como uh, to our treatment plant located in the Wall Township. <clears throat> uh, later on in the slide, we'll be looking back into the watershed. Uh, a critical thing to start this presentation out with is, is uh, in New Jersey, there are, there are statutes that define uh, dam, what, what a dam is in New Jersey. Uh, and the, we've had a number of meetings collectively, the, the, the stakeholders uh, with, with representatives from the DEP, and they've discussed their position that the abutment that stops the free flow of water from leaving the lake and entering the ocean may in fact be classified as a dam under, under uh, New Jersey state statutes. And if it were, it would be a class three dam, which is a low hazard dam. Typically dams, by the way, <clears throat> you think of a concrete structure and, and you think of the negative impact of, of a dam being downstream of it, where if it were to break, it would flood a hose downstream. In this case, it's quite the opposite. We have a, a, what might be a dam <clears throat> at the eastern end of the lake that, that prevents the free flow of water into the ocean, and in fact, this is contributing to the flooding of homes and infrastructure in the area. <clears throat> um, a class three dam, again, it's low hazard. Uh, the higher hazards so of the four classifications, four, three, two, and one, one and two being the highest. <coughs> New Jersey has focused on one of the class one and two dams uh, very strongly since uh, uh, Hurricane Floyd, and the threes and fours have been left kind of on a back burner. And that once, once, uh, <coughs> once they've addressed the enforcement actions required for the higher level dams, they tend to move to these dams. <coughs> so it's going to become critical in bringing up this dam structure further on in the presentation. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't have to tell any of you about the historical flooding. <clears throat> it, it's not only is it historical, but it's more of recent history. In the last 10, 15 years, we've seen that lake overflow of banks more than you had in the prior 50 years. Uh, and there are reasons for that. There, uh, you know, one is, I think, aging infrastructure. Two is infill of, of uh, uh, impervious areas within the watershed. <clears throat> We'll get into that in a little bit. And then three is, is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the effect of rising sea levels and climate change and how that might be affecting what's happening at the lake and why we're seeing more and more negative impact from it. <clears throat> uh, there are really two types of flooding that can occur in the lake. This happens to be a photograph from November 1st uh, in the days immediately following Sandy. And it clearly represents, if you can see in the back, <clears throat> The, uh, the darker areas are areas that are, that are uh, still remain filled with, uh, with floodwaters. But there are two types of, of events that can affect this lake. One is, is rainfall, 
where water is coming in from the watershed and can't get out quick enough into the ocean. Obviously, you don't know those places to go, so the lake, the, the lake level rises. <clears throat> the other effect is a coastal surge effect, and we're not here tonight to talk about coastal surge. Uh, coastal surge is a, is, a, is a work effort that's orders of magnitude beyond what our discussions have been over the past several months. We're really here, moreover, to talk about watershed-driven rainfall events. <clears throat> and in order to talk about that, we want to apply some science to it to, to, to have people better understand it. <clears throat> What happened in Sandy, uh, it was a little bit different. Not only did we have a coastal surge where water came in, that coastal surge damaged the outfall, and the outfall was inoperable from, from the moment Sandy arrived uh, up until uh, right before the beach season opened. <clears throat> and re the result of that was, was not only that we had the floodwaters trapped because they couldn't get out through the outfall, but we had continuing influent or water being discharged into the lake from the watershed. <clears throat> uh, and that's really where South Monmouth began to get involved. <clears throat> we had been involved out here a number of years back, but, but we got involved in this event because you had a, you had a broken outfall, you had a rising lake, we had a northeast storm being predicted coming up the coastline. <clears throat> we had already lost millions of dollars in assets in these two locations, <clears throat> and we were concerned that with the, with the lake's inability to discharge, the waters would receive, would, would begin to continue, would continue to back up in a westerly direction and, and compromise our treatment plant work located in Walt Township. So we needed to not only gain access to what has been damaged, but prevent further damage. Uh, the, the order of magnitude, if, if our treatment plant is, is, is impacted, it could be hundreds of millions of dollars, and we lose service to eight communities. <clears throat> so we needed to, to take a place in the, in the preventive measures going on out there. <clears throat> so, uh, next slide. We'll talk a little bit about the watershed. Uh, you can't see it, I, I can barely see it, I'm closer than you are. Um, there's a blue line uh, which depicts the watershed area. So you'll just get a, or a placement, uh, here's the ocean front, here's Lake Como, here's <clears throat> the borough of Lake Como. Uh, we're coming back across the Third Avenue come up 18th Avenue all the way to Route 35, the watershed. So the waters that, that fall from the sky, hit a piece of ground, hit a rooftop, or hit a driveway, or a, or a paved area, from as far as, uh, let, let's say a quarter to a half a mile west of Route 35, drain into that lake. So we're not talking about just a small, <laughs> isolated area in your community, uh, or Lake Colos community. We're talking about an area, the watershed area that actually is, is approximately 930 acres. So a 930 acre watershed draining into a 30 acre lake. <clears throat> Very quickly, and we're going to get into these later on, when, when you talk about water flow into a watershed like this, you, know, you can represent either in gallons of water coming in a day or cubic feet of water coming in a day. From an engineering perspective, it's easier to talk about how many cubic feet of water are coming in a day. And in a two-year storm event, the peak rate of flow coming into Lake Como is approximately 1,150 cubic feet per second. <clears throat> in a hundred year, it, it goes up to an order of mag magnitude of about 4,200 cubic feet per second. And I may be sending you off in the wrong country. If you're not knowing where I'm going, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So <clears throat> we'll go to the next section of the slide. So the, uh, and I think the other thing before we proceed into the, the dynamics about Lake Como itself and what happened is, is to get an understanding of a 100-year flood. Uh, that term gets thrown around quite a bit, and, and many people have different understandings of it. But a 100-year storm event <clears throat> is an event that has a 1% chance <clears throat> to occur in any given year, or a 1 in 100, a 1 in 100 opportunity to occur in any given year. Um, it's, so it's not a storm that can occur just once every hundred years. You could have three or four hundred year storm events in, a, in any given calendar year or any given one year period. And, and <clears throat> conversely, or uh, proportionally, if you look at two, four, 25, and, one, and 500 year storms, uh, it's just a different rate ratio of percentage. <clears throat> so. You'll see, as a matter of fact, most of you that, that most of you that may have had some damage to your homes or, or paying attention to what FEMA's doing, they've actually backed away from 
their 100 year storm description have gone to these percentage based uh, uh, descriptions. <clears throat> what this is, is it's a uh, hydrograph of any given water body. We'll have one up there in a second about Lake Como itself. And we, I wanted to just explain very quickly what happens when you have a rainfall, it's inside the 930 acre watershed. <clears throat> It falls, hits a rooftop, hits the, hits the sidewalks. Uh, it goes through the storm sewer collection system and ultimately goes to the lake. So this, this hydrograph is really a period of time over a uh, distribution of, of rain. So if you look at <coughs> what, what, what will normally happen on, in any watershed, it begins to rain and the rate of water begins to come in very slowly. But as, it, as the rate of water from the far-reaching areas of the watershed get up to the river that it's discharging into, or in this case, a lake, <coughs> you see a rapid rise in the volume of water or the rate at which the water is being discharged either through a, through a river or into a, into a lake. <coughs> and this is the delta that's creating the problem over Lake Como. <coughs> and we'll, we'll get to a specific on Lake Como in a second. <coughs> So the other thing I think before we get to the hydrograph we'll talk about, uh, this is simply a, a profile view of the outfall structure of Lake Como. The lake would actually be right over here. You have a spillway, a 30-inch pipe that next down to a 24-inch pipe. This uh, hump, if you will, uh, is, represents where Ocean Avenue lies. Uh, and then you have crib pipe out into the ocean to discharge. Probably the most critical thing that, that you need to look at when you're talking about the, how that pipe operates is that it's tightly influenced. So as the tides change, the rate or the ability of this pipe to pass water through it becomes influenced by the, by the water uh, in the ocean. <clears throat> um, the next critical thing, and this is where New Jersey is taking its position that there's a dam out there, is that uh, it's a measurement of elevation between the height of the dam, the, total, the, the maximum height of the dam, and the toe of its slope. And that, that delta in distance is greater than five feet classified, in New Jersey it's classified as a dam. And actually go even further, it's either that delta of the toe and the height of the dam, <coughs> and or whichever is lower in terms of the outlet of the, of the uh, overflow. So that's where they're holding their position, and it's one that we need to either drive home, either it is a dam or it isn't a dam. We'll continue to talk about it as we go on. Uh, the way the water enters the pipe is through a single overflow structure, which is which is fairly rudimentary. It's a, cat, it's a double catch basin with a uh, two and a half foot weir device. So it's just a single flat piece of metal, two and a half feet wide, that allows water to flow from the lake <coughs> into this basin and then falls down into the pipe and into the ocean. Uh, this causes a restriction uh, that, goes, that, that, that can be addressed quickly and, and we have a, a plan and work to, to try to uh, make something happen out there. <coughs> uh, with respect to Lake Como, the actual pipe that's out there, this pipe has a maximum carrying capacity at peak when it's totally submerged uh, by five feet of water of 40 cubic feet per second. <coughs> If you remember the numbers we threw up before, they were much larger in terms of the area rainfall. <clears throat> um, so once the, the inflow into the lake exceeds this 40 cubic feet per second, and again, that's only after it's flooded, most likely to an elevation right around the curve line on, on North Boulevard, Lake Como. <clears throat> uh, what you have there is you have between, between the time that it, it, as it begins draining, by the time it gets to its peak, you're, you can store water within a lake and you have a maximum storage capability of about a 10 year storm event. <clears throat> so here's the hydrograph for Lake Como. Significantly different than the hydrograph that we showed you before. Because the hydrograph that we showed you before was in a rural setting where you have permeable soils throughout the watershed. In this watershed, you don't. Know, this watershed, we have rooftops and we have black, which I think has contributed to uh, the the uh, frequency of these type of events occurring over the over, more recent future. <clears throat> this is a, is a blue line that, that's above the zero line in this graph. So here we have flow in <coughs> feet per second. The 
here we have a duration of about 28 hours. This blue line that, that's uh, uh, a quarter of an inch or so above the zero line, that's the rate of capacity of the pipe that leaves it with Como. So you, that pipe has a, has a 40 CFS capacity. And you can see, as in the beginning of a rainfall event, it does fine. And at the end of a rainfall event, it begins to catch up, to, to catch up with the in, incoming waters. But this delta, anything above that line, is what has to be stored in the lake. And at that point in time, during a rainfall event, you've all seen it, that it happens in the streets. Uh, you get a real heavy rainfall event, you see water coming out of your catch basin instead of into your catch basins. <clears throat> and that's because the rate of flow in its entering the system is greater than the pattern. Or its ability to discharge it. So that, in and of itself, is what needs to be targeted and what needs to be addressed. And I might add that this hydrograph is for a 10 year storm event, not a 100 year storm event. If you're a 100 year storm event, you need to raise the ceiling in this building to, to, to draw hydrographs <coughs> to the same scale. Uh, so again, uh, getting back to some of these inflow rates, a two-year storm comes in at 11.45, a hundred-year storm so this is almost four times the order of magnitude. Uh, and here we have a pipe that's only carrying 40 CFS. Uh, and again, these are, these are peak flows, so you can average them out, but you can't, the, the lake doesn't have the ability to pass this peak, nor does it have the ability to store <coughs> the peak without exceeding its banks and, and the subsequent the damages inside the communities that we've all seen. <clears throat> so, uh, what do we got coming up here, Ryan? So here's the effects that Sandy, uh, or Lake Como has had on Smyrza. And, and, and I want to communicate this clearly so that you understand what our spin in this game is. is <clears throat> we have two pump stations that were totally devastated during Sandy. We have a loss of service to uh, residents in Belmore, Lake Como, and Spring Lake for seven consecutive days as a result of Sandy. That total estimate of, of, of the damage just for Sandy alone is $2.88 million, and the number climbs every day before we can remediate. <clears throat> and in addition to that, we've invested nearly another million in the past seven years responding to flood damages as a result of this lake. And, and it's put us in a position that, that we can no longer tolerate. We've invested more into this asset than the value of the asset itself. Uh, so we have embarked, well, and, and, and next slide, and what is the next level of threat to us? We've lost a pump station here, we've lost a pump station here, and if we allow this lake to continue to flood over time, and some of the predictions that we've seen over, over the next uh, uh, several decades, there may very well be a position where our treatment plan is compromised. And we just simply can't let that happen. <clears throat> uh, that, that, that today is probably a $300 million or more asset that, that, that you pay for and that we operate and you pay for on a continued basis. Uh, what's, what's important to note here is that the main tributary coming into Lake Como, Polypod Brook, actually flows directly around the treatment plant and further up into the watershed. <clears throat> So that gives you some of the dynamics of what's happening out there. Uh, one of the things that we do, we, we're a, a capital oriented organization. We own infrastructure, we need to maintain it, we need to maintain it for years to come. <clears throat> and we have capital improvement plans as well as, as uh, asset management programs. And, and we have subscribed to the concept of climate change. And I'm not here to sell you on climate change as to what's causing it or how it occurs or why it's going to occur. But I think we can all agree that something's occurring that's, that's affecting that lake and affecting your ability to reside around in, in, in a fashion in which you should be able to reside. Uh, so climate change deals with sea level and, and, the, and the natural rise of sea level. For the past 50 years, 100 years, 50 years, the past 100 years, Sea level has risen in New Jersey over two feet. If you go out to, to, to uh, 2065, it's projected to rise even greater than that. <coughs> uh, that does not even take into consideration storm events. So we're just talking about a natural falling of the land mass coupled with a warming earth. <coughs> uh, so there, there are predictions, not by us, but by the scientific community. As a matter of fact, this is a software program written 
and, and adopted, uh, written by Rutgers and NOAA, adopted by FEMA. And, and this is a baseline. This is where we stand today with Lake Como at the current sea level. <clears throat> and again, no uh, influence of, of, uh, of uh, climate change and or sea level rise. And in the inset, we have a photo standing on Third Avenue in Lake Como, looking up towards their pavilion uh, along the uh, northerly bank of the, uh, of, the, of the impoundment. Up in here, this is, this is how you drive the software program. And we're just going to show you a couple snapshots from it. You can, you can buy in as, as, as little or as most as you want into, into what the scientific community is saying in terms of sea level rise and how it's going to affect this lake. <clears throat> uh, we're going to go from, from a baseline where we are today to a maximum predicted value out in 2065 to show you what the scientific community thinks is going to happen with this lake. So we can affect that. Look at the widespread area of flooding, how it's increased beyond its banks. This is a day-to-day -day scenario. This is not a storm event. This is the projected water level in Lake Como, if nothing's done, in 2065. There is the picture of Third Avenue. We didn't, we didn't make it up. We're, we're just taking it from the scientific community and applying it to the, the levels of science that we use in, in, in developing our own infrastructure. As a result of this, we're actually moving our Lake Como pump station thousand feet out of harm's way, I think about five feet up in elevation. Uh, what's, what's really interesting with this slide uh, is that <clears throat> you see the massive flooding, you see the flooding up here again in Silver Lake. What you don't see is you don't see a flooding across the ocean. So what you have here is you have the elevation of water in the ocean pushing its way back through the discharge pipe of the lake. Thus, and water sees its own level. <coughs> So the water is actually pushing itself back through the pipe, the outfall pipe of the lake, and it's left as is. And this, this water body seeks the same level as this water body. And obviously, obviously it will underlay with, with tidal exchange. <clears throat> so that is an issue that very much concerns us. And again, that's not related to any single storm event uh, or, or high or, or tidal or, or abnormal tidal influence. <clears throat> So I've said all this, we can advance quicker. And what's really interesting is if you look at this, what you have in, in projected for a maximum occurrence of 2065, it's almost a mirror image of what we saw in the sand. So it, it, it's a, in my view, it's a, it's, a, it's a grim picture. But what's really interesting is what, what the solution lies here. If you can prevent the water from coming back in, then, then you've got a solution that can be, that can be plotted to prevent the flood. Uh, <coughs> So what did we do when we got involved with, with uh, the uh, immediately immediate post-Sandy uh, after action plan, uh, or, or response plan, I should say, is we mobilized 80 million gallons per day in the monthly system. <clears throat> and we did that to draw the weight down so we could access our infrastructure <clears throat> to prevent the flooding of, 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 uh, of our treatment plant, as well as assist the communities that have been devastated by the flooding of the lake. Uh, this number was a number that was uh, put together very quickly and we want it to be an order of magnitude that would, that would <coughs> not only draw the lake down, but, but uh, assist us in preparing for the Northeast storm that was coming up the coast. <coughs> and I can recall talking with the mayor about it and he said, you be bring big pumps and when he came out there and saw the big pumps, he was sort of a little impressed. <coughs> uh, the, the order cost to put that together was $800,000 just to mobilize. <clears throat> when they run 24 hours a day, you're talking about uh, 10 to 15 thousand gallon uh, dollars per day in fuel bills. <clears throat> uh, so it's obviously, obviously something that you know, we couldn't withstand for a long period of time, uh, and, and there's got to be a better solution. <clears throat> so we go to the next slide. Uh, since, and that was because the lake's outfall was plugged, and it would have been overwhelmed anyway. Uh, since that period of time, uh, the outfall has been temporarily uh, restored uh, back to its original uh, 40 CFS uh, output capabilities. And in addition, we've installed, uh, when I say we, I mean we, the stakeholders, have installed uh, four additional 18-inch pipes under ocean pipes uh, in the event pumps are needed while a long-term action plan is being, being crafted. Uh, we'll be able to pump 
under Ocean Avenue as opposed to over it, and have less of an impact on uh, traffic on, on Ocean Avenue and tourism. Like, uh, and this just affects the pipeline going under Ocean Avenue from the lake area, under Ocean Avenue, and back up onto the beach. So, moving forward, and, and I'm racing through this because I uh, may not seem it to you, but it is to me. Um, <laughs> One of the things that, that, that I wanted to communicate clearly tonight is, is why we're here and what keeps us in the picture. Uh, we've had all this devastating damage. <clears throat> uh, we're going to mitigate mitigate our way out of the immediate effects of Lake Como. We're moving the Lake Como pump station, and we're going to provide a mobile enclosure unit in our Pitney after pumping station. And we expect to have those improvements done within two years or less. <clears throat> And at that point in time, we don't have a lot of skin in this game unless we have a major, major flood event. <clears throat> uh, so our concern is that if, if there are going to be improvements done out there, they need to be done to an order of magnitude. And, and if we're going to be involved fiscally for supporting that concept, then they need to be done to an order, order of magnitude <clears throat> that we receive a benefit from it and that we can continue to partner, not only in terms of a facilitating construction of it, improvement out there, but, but to partner uh, in terms of fiscally uh, uh, providing uh, some relief to the communities that are affected as well as themselves. Uh, so in our, in our position, if an improvement is done out there, it needs to be a 100-year flood or up to 500-year flood uh, mitigation effort that would keep us in the long-term game. <clears throat> um, where else are we with, with respect to the, uh, to the lake? Uh, there are none other. You know, a host of outstanding issues. I think the stakeholders are clearly identified. Ownership of the lake becomes an issue. The, the dam regulations, um, and I say that almost facetiously, the dam dam regulations, uh, they, what they say is that, the, that the, the entities that own the property that stop the free flow of that water from the lake into the ocean, they are the owners. And in the, the, the case of Lake Como, their, their position is that, that Belmont is a partial owner, Spring Lake is a partial owner, as well as Monmouth County. Uh, Monmouth County does, doesn't share that opinion, and uh, I won't speak to the other communities. <clears throat> but uh, So what needs to be resolved sooner than later is ownership, if in fact we have a dam. And then if we have a dam, we need to address it, because the, the statutes then say if you have a dam, you need to design for uh, the peak 100-year storm event flow. And that sets then the standard <clears throat> for which you're going to provide a level of resiliency and then you decide whether or not you want to go beyond that. <clears throat> Making an investment short of 100 years or, or without the full knowledge of, of uh, whether or not you have a legitimate dam out there, in my personal view, is, is, is throwing good money at the dam. You need to identify those things, get them taken care of, and then move forward. <clears throat> There are a host of regulatory issues on a project like this. There's no short-term solution uh, the, in terms of a, 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 a final approval. <coughs> you've got capital, you've got wetlands, you've got stream encroachment. There's, there's all sorts of, of uh, regulatory issues that will have to go through. So it's going to be a, a several-year undertaking once you decide what needs to be done. And then there's a the question of funding. And, and again, with respect to South Mountain, I think I've made our core our, our clear. Uh, I think we can also target uh, potential 404 uh, relief monies through federal government as well as some other monies that might be out there. <clears throat> uh, so that, that's really it in a nutshell as to where we are with this. In terms of, of um, we have one of the Trent? Yeah, there it is. So in terms of where we are, temporary planning. We, we've had a number, of, a series of meetings over the last 10 months. Uh, there's a there's a uh, interlocal agreement that's being circulated as we speak to try to put all these four parties together on the same page in terms of, of, of an agreement to move forward. <laughs> that moving forward is limited uh, right now to almost exclusively to developing an emergency action and response plan while, while we wait decisions that, that will affect long-term planning. So we want to get the four parties together, agree to agree, then have an action plan said that, all right, if we see a storm coming up the coast, this is how we're going to respond. We're going to discuss those things beforehand. Uh, we want to have an order of magnitude funding provided up front 
to, to uh, facilitate you know, making, uh, mobilizing pumps of air uh, <coughs> necessary out there. And put that together and then continue to move forward with those other issues. Who's involved? We have all the stakeholders that are, that are truly involved. Can we get the regulatory issues uh, in front of us? What level of resilience are we going to be are we going to build to? And then begin to put together a plan for, for some real long-term improvements. Uh, and I, I think that I think that wraps it up. And again, I, I feel like you, you, want, you want to go through the uh, you know as we discussed some of the uh, short-term uh, mitigation efforts and then <coughs> what um, you know what we believe is the long-term uh, culvert. Okay. Uh, there, so in terms of short term, um, we don't want to talk into microphones. Yeah. Okay. In terms of short term, one of one of the things that we discussed was uh, making a very simple and uh, rudimentary modification to the existing alcohol structure. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, <clears throat> what you have is you have this two and a half foot of overflow area that restricts the flow of water into the pipe while the leak is on the rise. <clears throat> And it's, this is no uh, uh, total solution, but, but but can buy time, and what can make the lake accept lower uh, level storm events a little bit easier is to extend that length of weir. And so we, we've talked with the stakeholders about putting a similar weir both on the south and this is the west side of the south and north side, so you would triple the amount of overflow. But again, it's not going to take on a hundred-year storm, but when a ten-year storm hits it's going to slow down the rate of rise in the lake. <clears throat> and and it, it buys people time. It buys the, the, the responders time in terms of, in terms of mobilizing. Um, and, and it's something that, that uh, we, we are working towards getting done quickly. Um, right now, we, we've run the calcs, and, and we ran those calcs uh, for the sake of argument on the back of the back. And it was something that we discovered after we had done the hydrology, <coughs> hydrology of the lake. Uh, so Spring Lake is taking a second look at the calcs, and we agree, we think, I think we see something happening out there very shortly. <coughs> uh, Ms. Mary, there's a question in the audience. Well, uh, did you talk about the long term? Well, the, the long term, there's, there's a number of different ways to, to solve the problem. Uh, an underflow outfall surely isn't it because if you, if you buy into sea level rise, the sea level rise is just going to come right back up your outflows. You need to do something to elevate. Um, that we, there were discussions about the potential of putting in a, a box culvert system, which is a big concrete box underneath Ocean Avenue, and let the lake rise to a level and then flow across the beach uh, during these storm events into the ocean. Uh, some of the early work that we had done uh, went full scale. And so, you know, let's, let's, let's look at taking on this big storm event and help get done. We've, we've looked at uh, uh, providing permanent pumping facilities out there. <coughs> and, uh, and, and all of those carry different uh, uh, orders of cost associated with them. All of them are very drafty right now uh, and need to be you know, exploited further. And that, that's, I think that's more of the median uh, uh, planning efforts that need to take place. So I'd love to answer your question. Sure. Uh, anyone from the <coughs> neighborhood that uh, was, was affected by Lake Como that has any questions? Yeah, I, I. No, you just have them from there. Oh, Rich. I okay. Uh, Rich Seidel, 2010 Surf Avenue. Uh, but really, a couple of questions. Uh, the lake agreement, for the most part, has been on the table for quite some time, and it hasn't been able been um, it hasn't moved forward at all. So uh, when we met with Mike on a couple of different occasions now, he mentioned the short-term solution here. And this short-term solution would at least increase the amount of water going out of the lake substantially for very little dollars. All I would like to know there is whose decision is that? Yeah, um, I think it's a stakeholder group decision. And, and when we met, we, we, we met subsequent to our last meeting. By the way, when, when you say we met, you, you attended our Smurfs meeting. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we had exchanged dialogue on that. Um, we met uh, immediately subsequent to that meeting. I think it was August 14th. Uh, that concept was thrown on the table. Um, and, and between then and now, Spring Lake is running those calculations. I spoke to them as recent as, uh, I think, about 3 o'clock today. 
uh, and the calc is with the Because te technically speaking, that's actually in the borough of Spring Valley. That's right? correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I guess my other question is. It's very clear. We, so Mama, don't own any of it. No, no, no. De definitely true. <laughs> I guess my other question is. Uh, as far as emergency management from the lake and bringing it in, we now have four outlets to the lake. But those outlets are only dependent upon the generators we bring in to do the pumping. Whose decision and when those four machines come in to start the pumping of the lake? That's going to be part, part and parcel to the, to the, to the agreement. Uh, and we really haven't gotten that far. I know Colleen's drafting it. I'm happy to speak to that. So the, the, the four main parties that are going to be um, Signing on to the interlocal agreement, Lake Como, Belmar, Spring Lake, and Smurza. The, the, the interlocal is going to essentially formalize what has been practiced since the storm, which is that uh, days prior to a major rain event or a storm event, the business administrators of those towns, the DPW supervisors of those towns, and Smurza meet at the lake head and make a decision about bringing the pumps. Okay. Sometimes Belmar is paid for it, sometimes Belmar and Lake Como have split the cost. Sometimes all parties have split the cost. The interlocal agreement is going to establish that protocol adopted by all of the stakeholders as to the local share, it's a 25% share, when those parties meet again three days before the storm, decide to bring in pumps, if those pumps come in, help us to manage out on an emergency basis, and it's really formalizing what has been a very friendly agreement for the last 10 months. So that's thing one, is to memorialize it, so that, because part of my concern, frankly, has been um, you know, until we get this formalized, it's very necessary that Brian, Louise, Mike, and I all show up and talk. Mm -hmm. And I don't want it to rely on that. I, there could be an emergency and I'm detained. Well, who's my backup? My backup will be Mike Campbell. Um, so each, par each party is going to name who is authorized to essentially green light funding. Um, so again, not ideal. This is a very complex situation, even just to mitigate the, the hazard mitigation part of this. Um, but we believe that interlocal will set the parameters that no matter whether Louise is available or her number two is available, that the decision makers will show will be authorized to um, bring in those pumps and enjoy those that cost. Now, what this does is lays the groundwork for the longer term solution, which is a lot of what Mike's been touching on here. There is where we have. I mean, I, I kind of smile when Mike had that one bullet that said regulatory question mark because that is a big can of spaghetti. We've got DEP regulations, several different departments worth. Uh, we have the dam regulation, cap re regulations, Rossi regulations. And so why the interlocal is so important and why we front burn at that part of the process? Because that will establish the emergency protocol while we wade through this can of spaghetti of state regulation. So. Sorry, that was a little longer than I hoped. No, no, that was, that was, I think it, it, it's good that people can understand that. But my concern, again, is the, the three or the four different owners, and I can't still understand who the ownership here is. And I think a lot of us sitting here don't know what the ownership actually is, who's responsible for the lake. You've been doing this for, you've been trying very hard for a lot of years to formalize an informal emergency management agreement, correct? I can, I can speak in my tenure here, which is we have been having these conversations since Sandy, um, and it's, there is a draft circulating amongst us right now that will be coming to very okay. future council meetings, probably the next one. But I mean, this, this, a lot of discussions were had before regarding who's, re who's responsible for getting stuff on paper. I just want to see the process moved along, and I think there's a lot of residents here, and Martha can address to that. Uh, of, of concern that we just want something in place so the, so the, the residents of Lake Como, Spring Lake, and, you know, Belmar can be basically comfortable that they don't have to rely on three people meeting at a pump in, in pouring rain. That's right. If, if I may just add one thing to that. I'm just, just going to keep questions for people who live around uh, this area. I, I, th I think we're, we're, we're going along that course, and I think one of the things that, that you as a, as a resident that's affected by the lake you have to you know, keep in mind is that particularly during these temporary measures, there's only a, a fixed level of protection that's going to be able to be afforded. Uh, you're, you're not going to have a temporary measure that's, that's going to deal with that 500 year storm. It's not happening. And, you know, that, so just keep in mind that as we develop this plan, it's going to have a limited capacity in and of itself. 
and, and that's one of the things that we're trying to, to structure. You know, are they, are, you know, we, are we setting this thing up for a, a grander scale or, or, or something that's doable? Thank you. Someone else had their, yes, sir. Hi, Peter Pyro, 300 North Boulevard. Um, heard this presentation before, Mike. Uh, putting in the north and the southbound uh, modifications to the outfall pipe, can, can you give us an approximate cost of what that would be, give or take? I range? would throw a number. It's a couple thousand dollars. It's no, not, it's not a major event. No. no, so it's really a matter of really, let, you know, Spring Lake's running the counts. Uh, I think we're going I can't see why they would not concur with our findings, uh, and then getting that done um, should should be phenomenal. And then, as I'm sure you're aware or may not be aware, as part of a, a another proposal when the boardwalk was uh, proposed in Belmar, steel sheeting uh, down 26 feet and four feet up was supposed to be put in and is applied for through uh, a hazard mitigation request by the borough of Belmar. Has that been taken into account in terms of the inflow of water into the lake, in terms of that long-term projection, if in fact they put that steel sheeting in? That, that's something, that's a bridge that I think you cross when you, when you really get there and, and start doing some real hard design calculations. Uh, we, I, I do know it's there, and but, there's but, an issue there. And, and remember, that, that um, and we're still pursuing that through uh, hazard mitigation with FEMA, that wall is designed to absorb a storm surge. What he showed you, was, and that's why you can see it was dry between the lake and the ocean. It's not water coming over land, it's water coming Under. through the pipe. So that, 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 that I, wall seen, wouldn't do anything in, 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 in his example. It seems like the pipe should have a, a, a backflow on it. I know that that's, that's potential engineering design. Well, that's, that's a potential way to mitigate right. it. What he showed was just <laughs> if we did nothing, oh, okay. what would happen? So that's why there are going to have to be steps taken to move forward on it uh, and secure the funding. Gene, you want to say something? Thank you. Mike, Mike mentioned that when we were talking about that immediate concern, that was what, three times the amount of flow? I'm not sure either. On the immediate concern that we had with the grill, with spring lighting. Oh, yeah, they, yeah that was, that was that about three times. We said about three to times to the flow, flow, which would give us the time that it presently go, is going <clears> out <throat> three times the, the flow. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, it's it's three the, times the very given storm load. So, you, so you know, you're going to you're buying some time. That's about it. But but it's a it's a positive thing. It's something yeah. that can be done it's relatively start. easy. Uh, and and for those minor events where, where you see the, the, the lake rising and, and, and 